It is called Drang Lake, a kingdom built on the civilizations of old, founded by Vendrick, the Venerable King. This kingdom was established with the aid of his elder brother Aldia, using the souls of the four great ones. But what prompted the king to move heaven and earth to cross the ocean and wage war with the giants? Legends speak of a woman possessing unrivaled elegance and beauty. Her name was Nishandra. As time passed, Vendrick and Nishandra would grow closer. The two would solidify their union through marriage, and this culminated in her becoming the queen of Drang Lake. One day, she spoke of a great danger, an impending doom originating in the land of the giants. Chancellor Welliger, an advisor to the king, confirms these events. Long ago, the queen came to us, alone, from a faraway land. She warned our lord of the looming threat across the seas, of the giants. These ill tidings were a fabrication, a great deception designed to fool the king. Together, Vendrick and Ashandra would accrue a great army capable of battling the giants. Vendrick favoured the strong, those who would take up arms and fight for a common ideology. Royal soldiers would form the main bulk of the army. Their equipment was constructed by the royal blacksmith from high quality materials. Among the soldiers in his ranks, sorcery was utilised, but Vendrick had a particular disdain towards miracles, lending credence to the idea that the king had little faith in the gods. Accompanying Vendrick and Ashandra was his elder brother Aldia, and so, with all preparations in place, the legions of Vendrick navigated the oceans and embarked on their conquest. The armies of the king slaughtered the giants, wreaking havoc and devastation. Taken by surprise, the giants stood little chance against the invaders. Vendrick had successfully defeated the giants and claimed his prize, unbeknownst to him that he was just a thread in a tapestry of deceit. Furthermore, some giants were ensnared and taken back to Drang Lake for experimentation, a cruel fate. The results of these experiments proved fruitful. Using the knowledge he gained, Vendrick was able to create an entity known as a golem. Sharing a similar appearance to the giants, these constructs were designed for hard manual labour. Devoid of a soul, the golems lay dormant. This meant that the golems would only function when given a steady supply of souls. Once absorbed, they will spring to life and glow with a bluish hue. Once perfected, Vendrick ordered the golems to construct Stranglate Castle, a monolith among the architecture of the kingdom, a symbol of vanity and victory, worthy of a monarch. The castle was specifically built by Vendrick as a symbol of love for Nishandra. The kingdom of Dranglake would flourish, entering a long age of peace. A peace so deep, it was like the dark. Peace would not last. A vengeful shadow emerged from the land of the giants. The king of the giants, also known as the giant lord, united his people and assembled an army a legion of vengeance with the sole intent of destroying Vendrick and his kingdom, built on the blood and enslavement of giants. The giants landed on the northern shores and set siege to King Vendrick's castle to claim an invaluable prize. Captain Drummond, a noble warrior within Vendrick's army, sheds light on these events. Long ago, the king crossed the seas, pillaged the land of giants and brought back a prize. The giants are no ordinary barbarians. A singular rage burns within their hearts. They cannot find it within themselves to forgive the misdeeds of our Lord. It is revenge for the kingdom's misguided barbarism. Some suggest that this prize was most likely the giant's kinship a key required for the path to the throne of wants. The giants never forgot the pain they endured under the conflict initiated by the king. Waging war against the kingdom of Drang Lake, the giants, with their unbendable will, plunged the kingdom into a perpetual conflict, felt across the generations, citizens abandoned the kingdom, and the future of Drang Lake lay upon a knife's edge. Vendrick held fast to hope, and eventually eradicated the threat of the giants. The giants were eventually defeated by an unnamed hero, but alas, victory came all too late.
This bittersweet victory marked the decline of the once prosperous nation. Drangalik has suffered a blow it could not recover from. A greater danger, even greater than the giants, now threatened the kingdom. The fading of the first flame. The undead curse rapidly hastened the deterioration of the kingdom. Enlisting his brother's help, Aldir and Vendrick began their research into souls. Vendrick attempted to delay the fading by exiling the undead and by employing the use of great souls. In direct opposition to the gods and the undead pilgrimage, Vendrick opposed the linking of the first flame. He chose not to relight the fire. Vendrick instead tried to find another path to be free of the cycle. Unfortunately, he failed in this endeavour. Vendrick's relationship with his brother also diminished. The arrival of the undead curse placed a strain on their relations. Aldir had an obsession with the undead. They fascinated him to no end. Day and night, he and his acolytes would toil away in his keep, performing experiments, trying to find a way to transcend the cycle. His infatuation with the affliction led him to study Gwyn, whose sin was to link the first flame, to prevent the Age of Dark. And so Aldir devoted himself to learn from the mistakes of the Lord of Sunlight, and in so doing, became the scholar of the first sin. Lord Aldir attempted to uncover the secrets of life itself, and viewed the undead as a key to this mystery. Although the king's elder brother helped found Dranglake, he later lost interest in the land's fortunes. No longer interested in the prosperity of the kingdom, Aldir turned his gaze towards dragons, attempting to elevate humans from the affliction into dragonhood, in order to escape the undead curse. Both brothers sought the truth, but through different means, and their fervour meant the eventual withering of their familial ties. Their fragile bond would cease to exist, once King Vendrick condemned his own elder brother to the mansion, forever isolating him within the confines of his keep. Aldir wanted to shed the yoke of fate. Perhaps he attempted to usurp the first flame, but instead was warped into an abomination a being neither dead nor alive, inhabiting the bonfires of Dranglake. Some say he achieved his goal, of transcending the cycle, though not in the way he intended. Others may view this as a failure, Aldi's body being tied to the bonfires, chained to the very thing he wanted to escape. Soon, Vendrick would discover the true nature of Nashandra, and that she was in fact a child of the father of the Abyss. Harboring a desire for the first flame, Nishandra set into motion events that would enable her to access the Throne of Wands. When the Chosen and Dead defeated Manus, his being dissipated into fragments, the smallest of which and the first to become sentient was Nishandra, as confirmed by Vendrick himself. The Abyss once had form, but then dissipated. And yet, traces of its existence endured. Each fragment thirsting for power, spread dark with no relent. My dear Chandra was one such fragment. A feeble, tiny thing that thirsted for power more than any other. Driven by insatiable lust for a worthy vessel. Nishandra coveted that which she did not have, power, and so she sought the throne of wands. She desired the Age of Darkness to become a reality, allowing her to rule over it as the Lord of Dark. Having realised this, Vendrick ventured into a self-imposed exile, but not before dispatching the Watcher and Defender to safeguard the throne. To his shame, he chose not to confront the Queen. Even now, he clung to his love for Nishandra. He was accompanied by a small troop of knights, as well as his right-hand man, Valstat, the Royal Aegis, a fiercely loyal companion and general of Vendrick's armies. There was also another, who was once devoted to the king. Raim, more commonly known by the title Fume Knight, was the left-hand man of Vendrick. He was a distinguished knight who was highly revered. Raim and Valstat were known as the left and right arms of the king, until their wills clashed and Raim was deemed a traitor. Ultimately, Rain would venture away, leaving Velstadt to protect the king himself. Vendrick hid away from the eyes of Nishandra and split his body from his great soul, forcing her plans into a stalemate. He remains in the undead crypt to this day, where he now wanders as a hollow. Velstadt and his knights still stand in his defence, 
ensuring no one can gain access to the king, leaving Nishandra as the regent's queen of Dranglake. And so concludes the journey of Vendrick, a man who witnessed both the rise and fall of his kingdom. I am no king. I am more fit to be a jester. I was unaware of my own blindness. We are feeble vessels with feebler souls. We would cast aside the prop of life only to face greater hardship. Are you another such fool or something more? Like a moth drawn to a flame, your wings will burn in anguish, time after time, for that is your fate, the fate of the cursed. One day, alone and dead, bereft of meaning, is lulled to Dranglake, a decrepit kingdom. This auspicious individual arises, only to find themselves in things betwixt. A dark confine illuminated by a crack in the mountain, a hut can be discovered within, this place is home to three old ladies. Moral appears to be reticent, and Gryant shows little interest towards the newly awakened. Strowen, however, provides some guidance. She helps the undead, who is absent of memory, recall their name, and provides them with a vague purpose. Her tone denotes that we are not the first, but in fact one of the many undead seeking something in Dranglake. For this withered kingdom has a certain allure, the goal of an undead is to seek souls, and in the process, lose them. Stuck in a cycle, and doomed to repeat it. Accompanying them is Millibeth, the housekeeper. She reveals that the ladies were once firekeepers. Three of four sisters. The fourth appears to be absent, as indicated by the empty chair. Perhaps she departed on her own, eventually residing in Firelink Shrine, many years later. The firekeepers want safeguarded bonfires, but if three can be found in one location, it is safe to assume they have abandoned their respective posts. Hope seems lost in the age of the fading flame, and so the firekeepers all but scattered to the wind. In addition, she refers to things betwixt as a limbo, a link between Dranglake and the outer world. Venturing towards the light in the crevice, a serene landscape unveils itself, painted with the orange hues of the sun, accompanied by the calming sound of crashing waves. Medulla appears to be a new home for the lost and dead. This small, decayed village is located on the coast of Dranglake. A large stone well, a mansion and a small tower mark the key features of the area. In the basement of Medulla Mansion, Shards of the Lord Vessel can be seen, a subtle reminder of the kingdom that once inhabited this land. Many adventurers, blacksmiths and tradesmen converge upon this point, as Medulla provides peace to all who would seek it. It is here where we first make contact with the Emerald Herald, Shanalot, a name gifted to her by her kin, the Dragons. Her role is pivotal in the events of Dranglake. Her original purpose was to shatter the undead curse. This is also the very reason she was brought to life. The existence of the undead and hollows occupying the land signify her failure to break the curse. As a result, she chose instead to shepherd the undead, providing them with Estus flasks and a vessel to channel souls, so that they may become powerful enough to slay the four endowed with immense souls. The names of the four are unspeakable, and so their identity remains a mystery for now. If this can be achieved, the undead may succeed the once king of Dranglake, Vendrick, and claim the throne of Want, the ultimate seat of power in this land. With this objective laid before the undead, they are granted the title Bearer of the Curse, a moniker shared by all who would seek the throne. Atop a staircase, sat next to a pillar, is Soldan, the crestfallen warrior, a man whose hopes have been all but extinguished. 
He refers to the undead as having an irreversible fate, suggesting that it is impossible to break free from this path, and that all are merely props on the stage of life. Failure, in his eyes, is inevitable, and so he sits in Medulla, a place where life is almost normal. Solden states that the real curse is to be alive, to walk this earth, and that the lack of death at the end of life is a predicament. His philosophical outlook certainly implies that he feels life has little purpose if the sweet embrace of death does not lay at the end of it. He also notes how firekeepers once tended the bonfires, and wonders where they went, unaware that three are living close by, avoiding their duties. Solden relates to the plight and struggles of the undead, but for now seems content to lead a stagnant life. In the distance, the tinkering of a hammer striking an anvil can be heard. In a humble abode resides blacksmith Lenegrast. The green skin of the smith reflects his undead state. Similar to the bearer of the curse, his memories have faded, although he has retained his ability to smith, as well as the memories of his daughter. Sometime in the future, a stone trader by the name Cloan hailing from the merchant land of Volgan, is convinced by the bearer of the curse to set up shop in Medulla. As her title implies, she is a trader of stones, materials used specifically by blacksmiths to upgrade armour and weapons. Cloan states, You see that blacksmith over there? Is he one of those hollows? He seems to keep eyeing me up. He sort of looks like my father. He's a blacksmith too, you see. The poor man's such a worrywart. But he wouldn't follow me out here, would he? <laughs> Conversing with Lenegrast reveals that Cloan is indeed his daughter. My witless daughter finally came home. Just as oblivious as she's always been. Well, at least now I can keep an eye on her. Despite recognising her, they will never be unified as a family, as Cloan fails to identify Lenegrast as her own father. Perhaps his undead form made him unrecognisable to her, or is Cloan suffering from memory loss, as all undead appear to? Sadly, the two will never be reunited, but Lenegrast can have peace of mind knowing his daughter is safe. In close proximity sits Marlin, the armourer. Similar to Cloan, this merchant also originated from the land of Volgan. He claims the Blue Sentinels have gained much power in his homeland, and so their blessing is required to set up shop, insinuating their blessing is only received if a donation of coin is given. In order to escape the competition, he travelled to Drang Lake, but has had little success. This has broken the morale of the armourer, as he resorts to begging, hoping people would purchase his wares. His timid nature is displayed with both his physical posture and trembling voice. However, as more souls are given to him and his shop expands, his confidence increases exponentially. Eventually, his personality exudes one of arrogance and greed. The deeper his pockets become, the more he struggles to recall his past. His memories fade into obscurity, but his obsession with wealth persists. Carillion of the Fold also moves to Medulla after a time, a great pyromancer and sorcerer who originated in Melfia. In the academic field, Carillion is highly respected, as seen with his station as a distinguished professor at the Melfian Magic Academy. The politics of his colleagues annoyed him to no end. He argued that the academies were terrible places to learn magic, which angered another teacher, Master Glocken. Ultimately, he grew tired of their petty squabbles, leading him to Drang Lake, where he could strengthen his knowledge in the magics. His apprentice, Rosabeth, who was once a pupil to Glocken, would follow him to Drang Lake. Rosabeth was an accomplished student of Carillion, as she was skilled in the art of pyromancy. She was also fascinated by sorceries. Once reunited in Medulla, Rosabeth decides to distance herself from her master, choosing to accomplish her goals by herself, a noble cause. 
Another prominent resident is stationed in Majula, a cat by the name Sweet Shalqua. Conversing with her reveals that she's potentially an ancient being, someone who predates the kingdom of Dranglake. Are you going to see the old ones? Those four who have grown so incredibly ancient. They must have sprouted quite a thick coat of moss by now. For heaven's sake, no one even knows their names anymore. She is directly referring to the souls of Gravelord Nito, the Witch of Isolith, Seath the Scaleless, and Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight. Her knowledge of these ancient beings implies that she may have lived during or close to the events that unfolded ages past. Surrounding Majula lies the Forest of the Fallen Giants, a historic location. This once war-torn land had seen much conflict. As the name suggests, this particular area was a key location when the giants retaliated and laid siege to the kingdom of Dranglake. The Cardinal Tower was built many years ago by Vendrick's soldiers, acting as an outpost of defence against the invaders. Giant corpses can be found throughout the zone, as well as hollow soldiers. Each warrior once belonged to the army of Vendrick. Even in this state, they defend their homeland. The graves of giants are dispersed across the area. Their remains withered and gave rise to great trees. Many years from now, one lone grave of a giant can be found in the Cemetery of Ash. An individual known as Pate makes an appearance for the first time, a mild-mannered treasure seeker similar to Patches. His trustworthy facade is a tactic used to gain the trust of the bearer of the curse. Pate's journey to Dranglake with an infamous killer known as Creighton of Mirror, a dysfunctional team to say the least. A cartographer by the name of Kale also recounts that a murderer had escaped execution in his homeland of Mirror, confirming that he is a homicidal individual. Creighton is first discovered captured in a cell, which he had initially designed to imprison Pate. Unfortunately, it appears as though he had been caught in a trap of his own making. He harbours a grudge against Pate due to his selfishness. According to Creighton, Pate would always steal the lion's share of the treasure and refers to him as a backstabbing knave. Just like Pate, Creighton veils his true persona. A choice must be made. Do we side with Pate or make an ally of Creighton? It is worth noting that Creighton's armour and weapon are replicas. It is doubtful that a disgraced killer would be a knight of mirror. Upon inspecting his armour, we can see that its design resembles that of the Knight Order of the Eastern Land of Mirror, but with some odd differences that catch the eye. Perhaps it is a finely crafted imitation. His weapon is also a forgery of the Dragon Slayer's Crescent Axe, lacking any sort of lightning infusion. The true axe belonged to the unbeatable Lothian, but he abruptly retired from the battlefield and was never heard from again. Some say that he grew tired of the frailty of human foes and set off to slay the legendary dragon. Lothian was a shieldless warrior. This explains Creighton's lack of a shield. Perhaps he was trying to imitate the legendary soldier. Nevertheless, the two can eventually be found engaged in a duel. It is here that their story concludes. The bearer can either provide aid to Pate or Creighton. The sole victor will display their gratitude but even this is a farce, as a booby-trapped chest will be left behind as a final farewell to the bearer of the curse. Turning back to the forest of the fallen giants, a great enemy enters the fray. The last giant is found contained within an underground cave, chained and impaled with numerous swords, with a pillar punctured through his torso. Why did this giant in particular deserve such treatment? Strangely, it appears as though the last giant recognises the bearer of the curse. Throughout the engagement, the last giant grows impatient and reckless. Losing the fight, he decides to tear off his own arm, to use as a makeshift weapon in a desperate attempt to slay the bearer of the curse. Despite his struggle, he is defeated. The soul of the last giant provides a window into the history of this creature. The lord of the giants, who had brought wreck and ruin to the entire kingdom, 
were said to have been felled by an unknown warrior. His beaten and broken remains were then dragged beneath the stronghold, where he was sealed away. The last giant was none other than the Giant King, who travelled to Drang Lake for revenge against Vendrick and his sins. No wonder the king placed the giant in a deep cavern and subjected him to great torture to keep him sealed away forever. And with that, the giants were no more. Close by, the pursuer arrives, a lumbering warrior with an imposing presence. This mad knight was originally from the kingdom of Alken. His sole purpose is to hunt down those afflicted with the undead curse, as stated by his ultra greatsword. The pursuer hunts down those branded by the curse, as if each undead soul that he claims will atone one of his sins. What these sins were are never revealed, although centuries later, his shield reveals the following. Far too heavy for an ordinary person, perhaps it signifies the foolishness of resisting the curse. It is possible that his sin was to attempt to resist the undead curse. However, we can never truly know the answer. Nonetheless, he is unyielding in his pursuit of the undead. Adjacent to Medulla lies Hade's Tower of Flame. However, the entrance appears to be blocked. Luckily, a woman by the name Lycia can aid the bearer of the curse. Speaking to her reveals that she's a devout disciple to the gods, having journeyed to Drang Lake to spread the word of miracles, so that all can bear witness to their wondrous power. According to her, the pathway can only be opened with the power of miracles. She has also found a possession of the miracle Soothing Sunlight. This miracle, once kept by the Lindelt Monastery, was stolen and never recovered. Based on this description, we can surmise that Lycia is a thief, a con artist swindling the undead for their souls. Although she opens a path ahead, it is not through the power of miracles, but by operating the mechanism using the Rotunda Lockstone, a stone which rotates the Medulla Rotunda, insert into the central pillar to align the Rotunda with a different passageway. Nothing magical about it, but a fine feat of engineering. We can discern that Lycia is not to be trusted. Furthering this notion is the appearance of the Phantom Invader, Nameless Usurper, a mysterious woman clad in the robes of a Lindelt cleric. This phantom is none other than Lycia. She is a self-serving individual whose goal is to obtain souls. Through the use of the crushed eye orb, the world of Lycia can be invaded, where she confirms her identity. Moving forward, we finally arrive in Hade's Tower of Flame, a beautiful landmark submerged in water. The architecture of the towers are evocative of Anorlando, the land of gods from many years ago. Defending the area are the Hade Knights, fierce warriors who will only attack when provoked. Whether Hade refers to a kingdom or was just a name for the land is not clear, for no records date back far enough to tell. All that is known is that the Way of Blue has its origins in Hade, and that Hade was later subsumed by the sea. The grand designs of the buildings suggest that this city was once fit for the gods. The Ring of the Sun Princess states, the Princess of Sunlight left on Orlando along with many other deities and later became wife to Flame God Flan. This item description denotes that Guinevere, the Princess of Sunlight, departed on Orlando and married Flan. Perhaps they lived in the Tower of Flame for a time. Residing in the tower is a dragon rider. Long ago, the dragon riders mounted worms and were feared on the battlefield for their unparalleled strength. The rank of dragon rider was reserved for honorable warriors who helped found Drang Lake. Together with the king, they crushed its former inhabitants and erected a magnificent kingdom upon their graves. Here we learn why the armies of Vendrick were so powerful and dominant, as Vendrick employed the use of dragonkind in his army to bolster his forces. A guardian dragon can also be found nearby. Built on the edge of the land lies the Blue Cathedral, a base of operations for the Blue Sentinel Covenant. Within the structure is an old dragon slayer. The old dragon slayer is reminiscent of a certain knight that appears in old legends. 
It is doubtful that this individual is Ornstein, but rather someone who is inspired by his legacy. Following the defeat of the Dragon Rider, the path to No Man's Wharf is open. This expansive area is home to Varangian sailors, cutthroat pirates that once inhabited the northern seas of Drang Lake. A former king launched a campaign to capture these terrors of the high seas, but rather than imprison them, forced them into hard labour at No Man's Wharf. Among the many foes in the wharf are the suspicious Shadows, a regiment of warriors that abandoned the Mirror Army to become mercenaries instead. Those who were especially adept assassins were often hired as bodyguards. In an attempt to stave off the curse, King Vendrick hired Shadowmen to put down the Hollows, but before long they were hollowed themselves. They are yet another reminder of Vendrick's futile attempt to stave off the undead curse. Deeper still, a bell can be discovered. Once rung, a ship is signalled to dock. Stationed at the brig of this leaking ship resides the Flexal Sentry, a monstrous creature that was assigned the task of emptying the dungeons of poor, cursed souls. This lizard-like creature oversaw the ferrying of undead into the Lost Bastille. Overcoming this adversary allows the bearer of the curse to utilise the vessel and travel to the Lost Bastille. The prison is home to the undead, who were once exiled by Vendrick. Undead prisoners roam the vicinity. Their appearance is indicative of their hollow state. Undead citizens are also held captive here. For many, their only crime was showing signs of the curse. Notably, some of these former citizens of Drang Lake were the victims of Lord Aldia's experiments. Their bodies are horribly disfigured as a result of the unspeakable procedures to which they were subjected. Their life force is now sustained by unstable and highly volatile souls. Jailers also patrol the perimeter with their stray hounds in order to ensure none may leave the Lost Bastille. Contained within one of the many cells is Strayed of Alarphis. Strayed was an established sorcerer who was personally invited to the kingdom of Alarphis. This kingdom was one of the many that came before Drang Lake. It once occupied the very land Drang Lake was built upon. Olafis was home to state-of-the-art sorceries and pyromancies, a perfect location for a sorcerer like Strayed. The most notable of his inventions are the pyromancies, Flame Swathe and Lingering Flame. In addition, it appears that the Ring of Resistance and the Dispelling Ring were also crafted by Strayed. Unfortunately, Strayed never accepted an apprentice, as a result, much of his extensive knowledge is permanently lost. His black hood reveals that people eventually feared him, and in the end, Strayed was led into a dreadful trap, culminating in his petrification. Strayed spent several lifetimes of stone. During this hiatus, kingdoms rose and fell, until the land called Drang Lake came to be. Once cured of his affliction, Strayed confirms the notion that many kingdoms came before Drang Lake. So, how long was I sat petrified? Long enough for the old kingdom to have crumbled, I see. Long enough for Olafis to rise, fall, and fade away, evidently. Drang Lake. I've never heard the name. Is that what they call this place now? No flame, however brilliant, does not one day splutter and fade. But then, from the ashes, the flame reignites and a new kingdom is born, sporting a new face. Further beyond resides the Rune Sentinels. Crafted by the man known only as the Jailer, these creatures have no corporeal form. It is only an empty soul that haunts the armour. Interestingly, the armour was inspired by the ruined knights who were dispatched to the Ring City, a place built by Gwyn to isolate the Pygmies at World's End, as confirmed by their armour. 
armor of the company of knights who were sent to the Ring City on an old king's orders. The knights sought the Dark Soul, but were so soundly crushed they had little choice but to swear themselves to the Judicator Giant. The ill-fated company was later immortalized in a dark fable, inspiring the aspect of certain golems in whom their name lived on. The knights were deployed, possibly by Gwyn, to obtain the Dark Soul. As time passed, the Rune Sentinels would eventually be created, influenced by their tale but devoid of a soul, making them more akin to golems than the knights they were inspired by. Another important landmark is situated in the Lost Bastille, the Belfry Luna. To understand the significance of this bell tower, we must first refer to two old kingdoms. The kingdoms of Alcan and Ven, long ago, flourished on these very grounds. They were both founded by the same man, but were reduced to rivalry and spite. The bellkeeper's attire speaks of the love between a prince and princess. To this day, the forbidden love of the Prince of Alcan and the Princess of Ven manipulates these marionettes. The twin bells symbolize the bond between two lovers who can never be united. The bell keepers are their eternal guardians, for that is their love. That is their curse. Their love was forbidden due to the strained relationship between the kingdoms. We can infer that the Belfry Luna was built for the Princess of Ven due to its affiliation with the moon. The moon represents femininity, as indicated by Gwendolyn, whose affinity with the moon led to him being raised as a female. On the other hand, the Belfry Sol is associated with the Prince of Alcan, due to the sun's connotations with masculinity. It is safe to assume that the Kingdom of Alcan once resided in the location where the Iron Keep now stands and that the Kingdom of Ven once occupied the lands of the Lost Bastille. Marionettes were constructed to serve as a means of defence for each tower. Just as life was given to the dolls, perhaps it was also given to the Belfry Gargoyles, who reside atop the tower, yet another measure of protection. Unable to cement their love, the Prince of Alcan was to be wed to another. A merchant of ladders known as Laddersmith Gilligan sheds light on this tale. That creature, she was human once, you know. Yeah. In fact, she was wed to the prince of that nearby castle. But her husband, uh, he had feelings for another. The princess was desperate and sought eternal beauty hoping that it would restore the prince's uh, affection, <laughs> you see what I mean? Gilligan is referring to Mytha, the Baneful Queen, revealing that the Prince of Alcan, despite his marriage with Mytha, was still enamoured by the Princess of Ven. Doubting her self-worth, Mytha became obsessed with delusions of unattainable beauty. She even bathed herself in poison, believing it would elevate her appearance solely driven by the desire to win the heart of her husband. But is the person in question the Prince of Alcan or the Old Iron King? The Queen sought the King's affection, even poisoning herself to attain beauty, despite the monstrous consequences, all for the compelling madness known as love. This could be referring to the Iron King, whose keep is in close proximity of Earthen Peak, the home of Mytha. Some may posit the theory that the Prince of Alcan may have ascended to the title of King, having climbed the ranks of royalty. However, the Scorching Iron Scepter places doubt on this notion. When the old king wrested this dilapidated region from the Kingdom of Ven, the act required all the resources the enfeebled Lord could muster. If the Prince of Alcan became the Old Iron King, why would he subdue the Kingdom of his beloved? Whoever Mytha truly coveted remains a subject of mystery. Even if the prince or the king did not love her, there was another who may have truly adored the baneful queen. The soul of the covetous demon states, there was once a man whose deep affections were unrequited. His situation is similar to Mytha's. Both possessed a deep love for another, but this love was unreturned. Despite this, he remained in Earthen Peak, where he became a glutton. In turn, 
he was transformed into the covetous demon, which only made him lonelier than before. At the lowest point of the Lost Bastille is a tower known as Sinner's Rise, a structure built to apprehend the vilest of all prisoners. At the end of the path, shackled by chains, dwells the Lost Sinner, a bug reminiscent of the parasites found in Lost Isolith worms its way into her eye sockets. Writhing in the skull of the host, the prisoner is sent spiralling into agony. Her attire is reminiscent of torture. The penal mask contains spikes pointed inwards, a brutal method of torment. A straight jacket is tightly cinched against her waist to restrict her movement. The penal handcuffs restrain the use of her hands and her skirt is a symbol of shame, worn only by the guilty. Even the blade, grasped firmly in the hands of the sinner, saps the life of its wielder. In her agony, the sinner has etched writings into the floor of the prison. What manner of person deserved such a barbarous fate? Not much is known regarding the identity of the lost sinner. Despite this, a few theories exist. Firstly, the soul of the lost sinner reads, the lost sinner eternally punishes herself for the sins of her past. Out of great shame and regret, the sinner imprisoned herself. Additionally, she's also found in possession of the old witch soul, the very soul that belonged to the witch of Isolith. In another cycle, pyromancers also aid the lost sinner in battle. Potentially, the lost sinner was a pyromancer of some kind. Perhaps she was once Magus Egil, a devout follower of the old dying king. It should be noted that the penal handcuffs used to bind the lost sinner also boost the power of pyromancy. If imprisoned of her own volition, it would make sense to wield something of power in order to maintain her solitude and prevent the old witch's soul from falling into the hands of a nameless undead. Or perhaps she's merely a puppet at the mercy of the Isolith parasite. On the other hand, the lost sinner could also be a great priestess who originated from Elium Lois. According to the Eye of the Priestess, all the great priestesses replace one of their birth eyes with an artificial one, returning it after their term was complete. You may recall that the Chaos Bug crawled into the empty eye sockets of the lost sinner, who may have willingly removed her eye to join the covenant of priestesses. Elium Lois was a frigid kingdom, ravaged by the old chaos. This would explain how the Chaos Bug came to be. The lost sinner lives deep within the Bastille. The fool, trying to light the first flame. It appears that the old witch's soul, in conjunction with the parasites, may have influenced the mind of the lost sinner, who in turn also tried to give fire its own life. When met with failure, she isolated herself, forever atoning for the sins of her past. For now, in pursuit of the next great soul, the bearer of the curse migrates to Huntsman's Copse. When the Iron King began to see the effects of the undead curse, he established this zone, a specific location designated for the hunting of the undead. Numerous cells can be found throughout the forest, where the undead would be caged. It would not take long for the hunters themselves to fall to the undead curse. As a consequence, no one was left to eliminate the undead, and their numbers only increased. Presiding over the area are the skeleton lords, who reigned from deep within the Huntsman's corpse. The Old Iron King commanded the capture of all undead, but those charged with the task were overcome by the curse. Succumbing to the affliction, the lords forgot their purpose, choosing instead to build a house of bones from the undead. Falcon the Outcast, a man steadfast in his belief of the dark, resides in the outer perimeter of the Huntsman's corpse. The art of sorcery and pyromancy were of little appeal to the outcast. Instead, Falcon chose to become versed in the knowledge of hexes, a lost practice which originated from ancient times. Hexing appears to be an offshoot of sorcery, but its specific origins are unknown. He states that those who choose to study hexes are a lonely lot. 
those who have a taste of dark are drawn into its vortex and rarely return. Perhaps it appeals to something deep within the human soul. Hexing appears to be a fusion of miracles and magic, a hybrid that appeals to humans due to their inherent connection with the dark. So fascinated is Falcon with the dark that he travels to distant lands spreading word of this magic. Neighbouring the area is a structure known as the Undead Purgatory, connected by an old and withered bridge. In the inner confines, an executioner and his chariot eternally punished the undead. The old Iron King persecuted the undead, ordering the executioner to butcher them repeatedly, crushing them under the wheels and hooves of the chariot. It appears as though the old Iron King went a step further than Vendrick, in his treatment of the undead, choosing to inflict misery rather than banish them from the kingdom. The chariot was created only to torment undead, and it took the form of a horrendous mad steed, a window into the soul of its master. Tichy Gren, a member of the Brotherhood of Blood, lies at the top of the purgatory. This covenant worships the god of blood and war, Nar Alma, those who profess faith in Nar Alma have rejected all that is this world, and vow to travel a path stained with blood. They choose to live a life drenched with the blood of the undead. The scythe of Nar Alma is imbued with the power of the dark. This is no place for talk of such things, however. This cult appears to have some connection to the dark, unbeknownst to the Iron King. If the king knew this, he would not tolerate their kind, as the dark is intrinsically linked to humanity and the undead curse, something which he detested. Rather than reveal this, the Covenant hid their affinity with the dark, and partook in the hunting of the undead. But the Brotherhood of Blood only participated in the killings in order to appease their god, by way of blood sacrifice. Leaving the purgatory behind, we now move to Harvest Valley, a land mired with poison. The large windmills fan the venom, causing it to blanket the valley and suffocate its inhabitants. Behind a small path, we stumble upon a sunlight altar. When closely examined, this altar is reminiscent of the Warrior of Sunlight shrines discovered in Lordran. Perhaps this is the very same altar that once resided in the Undead Burg. Many kingdoms had risen and fallen over the years, but this shrine remains. Worship of the sun, now a lost belief, was once widespread amongst great warriors. Moreover, the Sunlight Palmer reads, Perhaps these famed champions are no more, or perhaps they have no desire to appear in public view but their very absence has made tales of their brave deeds all the more alluring, and this shield memorialises one of their brethren. Some may say that the warrior depicted on the face of the shield is Solaire of Astora. However, there were once many warriors of sunlight, and this could just be a symbol used to represent all who are heirs to the sun. Beyond the valley, surrounded by windmills and blanketed in poison, stands Earthen Peak. Mannequins patrol the area, conniving ambushes who strike from the shadows. A fickle queen gave them life and tore off their faces. How else could she forgive those who dared gaze upon her? The peculiar art of puppetry is a vestige of the two lost lands. A queen breathed life into these dolls with the very miasma that afflicted her poison-drenched bosom, so that she would have slaves to serve her temperamental will. As mentioned previously, the queen noted here is Mytha, a woman who resorted to consuming poison to attain beauty and win the affection of her partner. The poison furthered her madness and caused her body to malform. By igniting the windmill, through the use of a torch, the bearer of the curse is able to disperse the poison in the adjacent room. At the heart of the tower, Mytha can be encountered, nesting in her empty bath of poison. It is here that the bearer of the curse puts an end to the tragic life of the baneful queen. Over time, Earthen Peak would collapse, sinking into the very ground it was built on. The structure would eventually crumble, 
becoming ruins on the outskirts of the Ring City. The scorched markings of the windmill are still visible to this day. Nevertheless, the next great soul lies in close proximity. The Iron Keep stands atop a sea of lava, a colossal fortress constructed entirely of iron. A merchant by the name Magarold provides insight regarding the state of the keep. There's good iron in these parts. An old king even used it to build a castle. But the thing was too heavy. It slowly sank into the ground. Fire spouted from the earth and, and the place turned into this. A plethora of both Alon and ironclad knights safeguard the keep, still stationed at their posts, in defence of their fallen king. Alongside them stands a smelter demon, a towering golem of infernal strength. Despite these obstacles, the bearer of the curse remains resilient and traverses the fortress. Arising from the depths of the ocean of fire emerges a king. His appearance is more akin to that of a demon than the man he once was. Much of the history of this figure and his compulsion for establishing an unassailable empire remains shrouded in mystery. There is more to the legend of the fallen monarch, as the bearer of the curse will uncover when in pursuit of the crown of the Iron King. And so falls the Great King, a man whose reach extended his grasp. The curse bearer remains resolute in their objective and sets their gaze upon the next soul. Returning to Medulla, the laddersmith Gilligan provides aid in exchange for souls. Using his expertise, he places a ladder in the pit of Medulla, enabling the bearer to descend into the rotten chasm. After many cycles, his deceased corpse can be found laying in the profane capital, surrounded by ladders. The grave of saints resides deep within the pit, a burial tomb for the devout and righteous members of Drang Lake. This territory falls within the control of the Rat King, defended by the Royal Rat Vanguard. Their purpose is to test the worthiness of those who seek royal audience. Having overcome this test, the Rat King departs in wisdom. The insolent fools line up to trample upon our burrows. My servant, dispatch these invaders, and thy reward will be handsome indeed. Determined to defend the Grave of Saints and the Doors of Pharos, the King had established a covenant in order to recruit warriors to aid in safeguarding the territories of the Rat King. The Rat King is proud and merciful, as any king true to his stature should be. The Rat King looks favourably upon those who would follow the path of right, even disgraceful humans. It appears as though the Rat King believes the lands of the underground are his to rule alone, and that humans have encroached upon his subterranean kingdom, building burial mounds in his territory, contributing to his disdain of humans. Having said this, he has not fully abandoned hope for humanity, as the bearer of the curse can be recruited into his covenant to make right the sins of the humans of old. Deeper still lies the gutter, an unstable structure consisting of wooden bridges and fragile shacks. This area is devoid almost completely of light, although sconces can be lit to illuminate the cavern. All manner of creatures call this place home, from hollows to bugs and disfigured creatures. Statues that spew poison are also strategically positioned throughout the area. The same statues which encircle the perimeter of the entrance to the pits, signifying that these carvings may have been disposed of in this well. Perhaps the residents of Medulla treated the pit as a dumping site for all unwanted items. Beneath the gutter is the Black Gulch, a derelict cave filled with parasites and creatures. The poison glows with a greenish tint, highlighting the path forward. Exploring the gulch leads to the discovery of a distinct individual by the name Darkdiver Grandol, the leader of the Pilgrims of Dark, 
a firm believer who urges the bearer of the curse to pursue the dark to his deepest depths. A dilapidated altar, similar to the ones found in the Shrine of Armana, act as gateways into the dark chasm. After conquering each portion of the chasm, the bearer of the curse arrives at the gate of the Dark Lurker. The appearance of the creature resembles that of an angel. The face of the entity is concealed in shadow by its hood. During the encounter, the entity proves to be a formidable foe, possessing an arsenal of various dark magics. Nonetheless, the Dark Lurker is defeated, leaving behind its soul. The dark chasm of old is the remnant of some ancient, dissipated being. The nature and identity of the Dark Lurker remain ambiguous. Its appearance is much more akin to a being of light, despite its affinity with the dark. From this soul, Strayed of Alarphis can create the life drain patch Hex. This distorted dark, brewed by Hexes, drains the life force of those who touch it. Perhaps the Dark Lurker's goal was to lure those with a fondness of the dark, with the purpose of devouring them for their humanity. Towards the edge of the gulch, the next great foe reveals itself, the Rotten, a towering monstrosity, whose body is the culmination of many hollows. Leading the pack appears to be a single hollow, a hive mind dedicated to the preservation of the decay. The Rotten embraces all in his sanctuary, for all things rotten or tossed away. He appears to be in the process of constructing one of the many small statues we see around the area. His delicate nature, when attempting to reconstruct the object, hints at his nurturing personality. The Rotten welcomes all who were rejected by the societies of Norm, choosing instead to embrace the blight and mutations of all creatures putting the populace back together again, piece by piece. Unfortunately, he must be put to rest. Once conquered, it is discovered that the Rotten was in possession of the old dead one's soul, the very soul which belonged to Grave Lord Nito, the first of the dead. Beyond the borders of Medulla, a shaded wood shrouds the area, a small dense forest enveloped in a thick mist of fog. A decapitated head of a warrior named Vangal speaks to the bearer of the curse. After the collapse of Feroza, Vangal deserted his kingdom and pursued mercenary work, although he is ashamed of this. Strangely, even Feroza's Lion Knights, a motley crew of rabid fighters, kept him at arm's length. His helmet resembles that of a beast, as he was not unlike a mad beast on the battlefield. The description of his character describes Vengal as a ferocious and deadly warrior who was feared even by his companions. This is further enforced by the description of his shield. The chisels on the face were carved by Vengal to count the heads he claimed. Many marks occupy the surface, indicating how prolific Vengal was in the number of lives he claimed. In a display of fateful irony during a particular battle, Vengal was beheaded. He remarks that he often has visions of his body and warns not to approach it, suggesting a link still exists between the body and mind. In the shaded ruins, his animated body is discovered, a mighty figure wielding a scimitar and a sword. Legend has it that it was built to test the limits of the strength of Feroza knights, until Vengal swung it about like a wooden plaything claiming ownership by demonstration. Nevertheless, the headless body is destroyed. Vengal is appreciative of this gesture and offers his summon sign as a symbol of gratitude, signifying that with the death of his body, his spirit was made whole again. A weaponsmith by the name Ornifex can be found trapped in a small confine below the ground of the shaded ruins. This captive crow demon closely resembles the creatures who once lived in the painted world of Ariamis. She is a crucial ally to the bearer of the curse, as she has the uncanny ability to forge weapons using the many powerful souls obtained along the journey. According to her, this technique was pioneered by Seath the Scaleless, though she does not mention him by name. It is said that our technique 
originates from a strange being that inhabited this land. A pale beast that lived long, long ago. We don't even know what exactly it was. Her dialogue also provides a clue into the origin of the next great soul. In the immediate vicinity, another important figure can be found. He can only be spoken to by equipping the Ring of Whispers, a trinket utilized by Roy, the explorer. Tark states that he and a woman by the name Najka were created by the same master, a tragically lonely soul who conducted experiments and from his madness gave life to the two. Similar to Tark, Najka was also a hybrid creature, however, she is much larger in comparison. Many seasons passed and the two grew closer and became inseparable. Eventually, they were betrothed. Sadly, their love would not last, as her mind withered and she fell to madness. For this reason, Tark states the following. I wish to ask a favour of you. I want you to kill my betrothed. Once, I always found her at my side. But as time went on, things went awry. She became violent, raging uncontrollably. Eventually, she came after me. He pleads with the curse bearer, asking for assistance in slaying his partner. Together, they pierce the veil of fog and confront the mad scorpioness. Tark does not falter and provides aid until the very end. With her soul put to rest, Tark thanks the bearer of the curse. Both he and Najka will no longer suffer in an eternal conflict. Meanwhile, the bearer of the curse enters the doors of Pharos, a location named after Pharos the Vagabond, a legend who wandered the land, creating contraptions to help those in sincere and dire need. The scope of his travels was so wide that Pharos has been mistakenly credited with many inventions that were crafted by others. A race of people by the name Gurm call this place home, a stocky, powerful race which once dwelt above ground. They were regarded as inferior by humans and unjustly exiled below. They are amicable by nature but harbour an intense distrust of surface dwellers, particularly humans. In addition, many of the Gurm living in the doors of Pharos have gone hollow and become threats to the living. Lonesome Gavlan belongs to this race of people. As indicated previously, the doors of Pharos are also a domain of the Rat King, as evidenced by the existence of the Royal Rat Authority, another ardent subject of the monarch. Venturing forward, the settlement of Brightstone Cove Soldora unveils itself, a mining village that was once ruled by a figure known as Duke Soldora. The eccentric lord, known for his fascination with spiders, built a town and a personal fortune by mining Brightstone. One day, the town was overrun, but Lord Soldora only stood by and watched, eerily contented. By examining the area, we can see its inhabitants have succumbed to the spider infestation, morphing into vile creatures. This parasitic species bury themselves into the body of a host, commanding them to move like a puppet. Each parasite thrives of their host by draining the blood from within. Eventually, we come upon a holy chapel, home to the prowling magus and his congregation. In this room, a small number of undead labourers, supplicants and hollow priests have gathered. The labourers are dressed in tattered clothing, resembling that of a prisoner, insinuating that many miners of the cove were indeed slaves. The supplicants appear to have fallen under the spell of the prowling magus, retaining no will of their own. They now serve the magus with blind dedication. Lastly, the hollow priests were once the clerics of Drang Lake. It is unknown whether they act of their own volition or as an extension of the magus's will. The prowling magus itself originated in Aldia's keep. Warlocks in Aldia gave rise to wicked things and even cast forbidden rituals upon themselves. No one knows if they were born mad 
or if their own misdeeds drove them over the edge. Each Aldian warlock would utilize a cursed bone shield, an item reinforced by a covert ritual that granted the shield the power of flame. Using a combination of dark magic, it appears that the prowling mages gained a devout following from the people of Brightstone Cove. Perhaps they turned to him in the darkest hour as their home collapsed under the weight of the parasitic infestation. The peasant settlers who toiled the farms and mines in the outskirts of the city were fortunate to succumb to the undead curse, as the higher class citizens who resided in the city were ravaged and became sustenance for the spiders. As the curse bearer delves deeper into the cove, the environment begins to change. The area is now blanketed by a coat of thick webbing, and the swarms of spiders only increase. Finally, the Duke's dear Freya enters the fray, a gargantuan, two-headed spider. Its body is protected by a layer of armor and a collection of spiders scurry to aid its master. The spider uses a flurry of vicious attacks, including a luminescent beam similar to sorcery. The ground is covered in the bones of the deceased, victims of the spiders who were devoured or infected. The bearer of the curse still overcomes the spider and its very being evaporates into the ether. The great soul now rests in the palm of the young hollow. The soul makes reference to a being known as the writhing ruin, an ancient thing whose shadow remains cast over the land. It first took possession of a solitary insect, but grew its power, feasting on the wealth of twisted souls found in the land. The writhing ruin could be a direct connotation to Seath, who physically writhed around due to his tentacles. Or perhaps it is more symbolic, referencing his betrayal of the dragons. In addition, Freya also drops the old Pale Drake soul, a soul which can be used to forge the Moonlight Greatsword, or manufacture a spell known as a Crystal Soul Spear. In wake of this revelation, it is no surprise that a pale dragon can be discovered, ensnared in webs, in the very nesting place of the Duke's dear Freya. This pale drake could possibly be Seath, or perhaps it was another who fell victim to the creature. In the adjacent room, the Lord's private chamber can be found, Sildora's obsession with spiders is further enforced by the cage found in his room. This cage most likely housed Freya in its infancy. Some posit the theory that Seath utilized the spider and Duke in experimentation, eventually giving rise to the colossal monstrosity. According to the spider fang description, supposedly the Duke himself, an eccentric soul fascinated with spiders, went on to take a form that was far from human. It seems that the fate of both Dukes, Seath and Seldora, are interwoven. As you may recall, the identity of the creator of Tark and Najka remain a mystery. That is until Tark states, What skill? You've defeated my master. But our master never dies, and he changes form so that he may seethe for all eternity. From this information, we can surmise that Seath's soul manipulates all who would use it, inflicting misery on those around him, forever carrying on his will in all manner of forms through his vile experiments. Just like the chosen undead of old, the bear of the curse has obtained each great soul, but this is only one step of the journey. At this point, Aldia, the scholar of the first sin, Fendrick's brother, makes an appearance for the first time. His form is reminiscent of a large bonfire, an amalgamation of roots and fire. Rather than shepherd the young hollow, he instead questions their very nature, and informs them to seek out Vendrick, and embark on the path of the king. Your honor, do you wish to shed this curse? Then accept the fate of your ill and face the trials that await you. Young Hollow, there are but two paths. Inherit the order of this world, or destroy it. Only a true monarch can make such a choice. 
Half grown hollow. Have you what it takes? Truly. Young Hollow, seek after Venric. He who almost became a true monarch. The Venric is certain to guide your way. Young Hollow, conqueror of fear. What drives you so to overcome the supposed curse? Tracing the king's steps, the bearer of the curses led to the Shrine of Winter, a gate that houses the path to Dranglate Castle, King Vendrick's work of art, the house that ruled a kingdom stretching further than one can comprehend. A long dark road lures newcomers towards the central seat of power, exposing a castle that towers above all. The bleak exterior reveals a sign of abandonment, yet the fortress maintains its aesthetic charm, over the hill and past the forest is the king's castle, where a man peered straight into the essence of the soul. Those who come to Drang Lake seeking salvation soon lose hope and turn hollow. It happens to them all, sooner or later. The Emerald Herald forewarns of the horrors that had taken place in the castle stating that little remains but wandering hollows, haunting the once prospering manor. She follows up with a reminder of the commitment binding the bearer of the curse to their pilgrimage. In attaining the throne of want, the Emerald Herald fulfills her purpose of guiding the undead to the fate of Drang Lake. What they choose to do with such responsibility is their choice alone. Surrounding the property are stone soldiers, Knights of Valstadt, the Royal Aegis. When Vendrick confined himself to the undead crypt, Valstadt followed his king and remained by his side. The knights in his service waited patiently for his return until they turned to stone. Primal knights can be seen guarding the premise from intruders. The mammoth-like creatures are the creations of King Vendrick, using the long-forbidden sorcery of his brother Aldia. Exploring the castle interior leads to an encounter with a ghostly figure named Chancellor Welliger, who identifies the bearer of the curse as a trespasser. Unaware of recent events, the Phantom is protective of Vendrick's domain, ignorant to the state of the world and the King's doom. As he recollects his memory, Chancellor Welliger unravels the truth and informs of how the fate of Drang Lake came to be. Little is known about the Chancellor, except that his apparel is identical to that of the Drang Knights, who were once feared mercenaries, suggesting that he may have been a sellsword at some point in time during King Vendrick's reign. In light of learning about the endeavours of King Vendrick and Queen Nishandra, the bearer of the curse advances through the labyrinth, fending off countless royal swordsmen, the remaining survivors from the war against the giants. Atop the castle resides Nishandra, seated on a monarch's throne, declaring herself Queen of Drang Lake. Brave undead, visit Vendrick. We have no need for two rulers. Brave undead, seek the throne. Follow the symbol of the monarch and do what must be done. The Queen explains that King Vendrick wielded the strength to rule his people and stand in the face of adversity when the undead curse spread like wildfire, but in the end never had what it took to assume the true throne. Nishandra urges the bearer of the curse to seek the former king, insinuating that he must be put to rest, as he now offers little contribution to the kingdom. Do her words ring true, or a mere fabrication to manipulate those who stand before her? Reality remains obscure for now, but the truth always prevails in the end. Roaming within the castle walls is Ben Hart of Jugo, crossing paths with the bearer of the curse on multiple occasions throughout their journey. Ben Hart is on a quest of his own, travelling from lands far in purpose of perfecting his swordsmanship and proving the worth of his greatsword. 
Originating from Jugo, Benhart is acclimated to long reaches of desertous lands, housing many sorceresses and corrosive ants lining the horizon of the desert. Benhart's persistence has guided him to Drang Lake, wandering the lands with his Blue Moon Greatsword by his side, an heirloom passed down for many generations. It seems as if he's on a mission for redemption, proudly carrying a shield emblazoned with a family crest of some sort, possibly representing his heritage, wielded as a badge of honour. Benhart, for one reason or another, feels the need to prove himself to his family, or yet prove his family's value to the world. Convinced that immense power slumbers within his heirloom, he seeks to conquer the powerful beings inhabiting Drang Lake. Believing that in testing his strength, the powers that lay forth within his weapon will reveal themselves. In search of etching his family name in history, Bernhardt meets the merchants Marlin and Magarold, who quickly realise that his weapon may be a replica of a far greater sword, the Moonlight Greatsword, a revelation that would shatter the hopes of this warrior if only his stubbornness would allow him to believe such claims. Bernhardt's ignorance may be a blessing, as his faith in the steel he carries has led him to pursue greatness. Would he have chased perfection if he knew the true worth of his sword, or lack thereof? In not knowing, Benhart fought and defeated many great souls, using nothing but a replica greatsword, mastering his craft along the way. In a sense, this brave warrior proved his worth more so than he could ever know. Traversing deeper into the castle, the bearer of the curse faces the twin dragon riders, one perched up on a ledge firing a great bow, whilst the other approaches with his weapon in hand. Although previously known for their unparalleled strength, these revered warriors stood no chance in defeating the bearer of the curse, having accrued many powerful souls through the course of their pilgrimage. Posing a prevalent threat, however, is the Looking Glass Knight, a champion who challenges visitors to the Lordless Castle Long ago, the King's Passage was a route taken by the bravest warriors to prove themselves, but now it only prevents one from pursuing the runaway King. Upon closer inspection, the Looking Glass Knight wields the King's Mirror as a shield, an item akin to the mirrors that are later found in Aldius Keep. The similarity extends even further, as in both cases, a knight can forcefully break through the mirror, emerging from the abyss-like confines of the glass. Where the knights arise from is unknown, but the looking glass at the castle is said to have been a passage to another world. In seeking King Vendrick, the bearer of the curse contests the looking glass knight, slowly wearing him down through an onslaught of attacks, until the titan collapses in defeat. Having proven themselves, the bearer of the curse descends deep underground, unveiling a hidden sanctuary known as the Shrine of Armana. Upon entering the sanctum, an enchanting melody can be heard travelling from afar, emanating a sense of peace that caresses the air, the calm before the storm. Long before the undead curse harrowed the kingdom of Drang Lake, the Shrine of Armana was created as a haven dedicated to sustaining the Demon of Song. When the demon developed a taste for human flesh, it was contained within the Shrine of Armana, but the line of priestesses who looked after the shrine and appeased the creature have died off. With that said, the Demon of Song escaped its prison, but remained confined to the Shrine of Armana, unable to find its way to the surface. The name itself derives from its ability to lure prey into its lair by mimicking the graceful harmonies sung by the Milfanito. The Milfanito were said to have been given life by Grave Lord Nito, who taught them to sing songs that would comfort the dead. The Milfanito have little concept of self, as their existence relies solely on singing, and they will continue to do so until they can no longer. The Milfanito can still be seen residing in the shrine, living a secluded life, and showing no interest in the quarrels of the world. One can even be sighted in Drang Lake Castle, imprisoned by an embedded who was once a human, but similar to the Demon of Song, became tempted by the taste of flesh. Unable to resist his urges, the Embedded bound himself eternally with chains, awaiting the day that someone would bring a rhapsodic end to his fate. To release the Milfanito, the bearer of the curse slays the Demon of Song, 
and in return retrieves the key to the embedded, which can be used to unlock the cage. Why is it that the Demon of Song holds the key to the embedded? It is unclear to what capacity, but similarities can be drawn between the two. Both disgraced by their lust for flesh, evidenced with the embedded, hiding his face behind a mask, whilst the Demon of Song hides within his own body, a subconscious indication of shame. Could they be one and the same being, a soul transferred from the frail body of an embedded to the demon found in the shrine? Unfortunately, no one remains to speak of the true nature of these creatures. Passing through the shrine leads to the undead crypt, where a mysterious figure awaits, confidently leaning back on a wall with his arms crossed. Akdain is a finito, and similar to the milfinito, was given life by the Grave Lord. His role is to watch over the dead, ensuring that they maintain their peace. Akdain warns that light is not welcomed in the crypt, expressing that in the past, humans were one with the dark, until the Lord of Light Gwyn banished the dark out of fear of humanity. Akdain intends to provide solace through darkness for those who've passed, bringing humanity closer to their natural essence. Did you come for him? The one called Fendrick. You will find him deeper inside. Many castle servants and the like have come to fetch their lord. But they rest here now, put to death by the king's own guards. Perhaps he's not in the mood for company. The king's shadow, Valstart, guards the undead crypt, preying on those who've come to find Vendrick. As a means to reach the king, the bearer of the curse is pushed to slay the loyal knight, putting an end to their long-standing service to the king. Forging ahead leads to the long-awaited meeting with the former king of Drang Lake. Vendrick, the once powerful ruler, now a shell of his former self, a hollow stripped of all his attire, his lifeless body roaming around a small dark room, having lost all sense of self. In pity of what the king has become, the bearer of the curse strikes Vendrick down, putting him out of his shameful existence and upholding the image of the potent king that he was, contrary to being seen in his current state. Granted the king's ring, the bearer of the curse is able to access Aldia's Keep, located in the far eastern outskirts of Drang Lake. Outside the premises, Lucatiel of Mirror can be found. She, along with her brother Aslatiel, were both respectable knights in their native land, held to high regard by the people of Mirror. Their competitive nature formed a rivalry between the two, ensuring that their abilities remained sharp but it is said that Lucatil would always fall short in surpassing her brother's achievements. Afflicted with the undead curse, Aslatil without a word left Mirror, never to be seen again. Having later incurred the same fate as her brother, Lucatil travelled to Drang Lake to seek answers to the curse, in addition to finding Aslatil, hopeful that her brother is still alive and well. The bearer of the curse encounters Aslatil at the entrance to Aldia's keep, but not in the state that one would hope to find him in. Failing to overcome the burden of the curse, Aslatil had lost all hope, and with that became a hollow, a fate most tragic. When Lucatil reached Drang Lake, she had already become convinced that one cannot escape the undead curse. But she never surrendered her will, as she held onto the possibility of reuniting with her brother. The remaining hope she harboured was crushed by what had happened to Aslatil. Her own kin forsook his knighthood to prey upon others, driven to madness by the undead curse. For what reason should she press on, when all meaning to her life had been shattered before her eyes? And so Lucatil, with no faith left in her heart, accepts defeat allowing the curse to extinguish what little light she had left inside her, the once prosperous Knight of Mirror, now one of many hollows in Drang Lake. Before surrendering to her fate, Lucatiel implored that her name be remembered, a dying wish bestowed upon the bearer of the curse. Many years on, a mask named after Lucatiel can be found, revealing that the bearer of the curse stayed true to their word, and spread the name of Mirror's most valiant warrior from one ear to another, keeping Lucatil's legacy alive for thousands of years past her death. 
Proceeding to Aldi's keep, it is evident that the location is discreet by design, sealed away by Vendrick himself, condemning his own elder brother to a secluded mansion. This stemmed from their dispute over how the pair would tackle the truth to the secrets of life. Confined to the mansion, Lord Aldia would invite various guests to aid in his experiments, but those who were summoned to the manor would disappear indefinitely, becoming vessels for his body of work. In visiting Aldia's residence, one can bear witness to his monstrous creations. Chained cages are seen suspended from the ceiling, various concoctions left untouched, basilisks held captive in enclosures, ogres roaming the hallways, and many malformed beasts dwelling in the manor's basement. Aldia used his hammer not as a weapon, but as an instrument to dissect his victims once they outlived their usefulness. The maniacal lord even kept giants in his manor, attempting to recreate the dragons of old. His trials led to the birth of the guardian dragon, an inferior breed to the everlasting dragons. Once given life, do the dragons watch over the land of their own will, or are they in the grip of one of Aldia's spells? Taking drastic measures, Aldia even created life severed from its physical form, believing that this may be the answer to transcending the undead curse. Born of Aldia's obsession with the first sin, the Forlorn lost both their corporeal form and a world to call their own. Now they drift into other worlds, ever in search of a home, but without self, one has neither beginning nor end, and so the Forlorn have only to wonder. Within Aldia's keep, a mysterious figure can be found seated under a giant staircase. This is the royal sorcerer, Navlan, who appears to be of two minds, fluctuating between multiple personalities. If the bearer of the curse interacts whilst in human form, the sorcerer remains distant, pleading to be left alone as he seeks no conflict. If one is to approach whilst hollow, the alter ego surfaces. Prior to the fall of Drang Lake, the royal sorcerer set out to devise new spells, in hopes of introducing new forms of magic into the world. In doing so, he mistakenly created a separate consciousness, tethered to his vessel. When the sorcerer sought strength, the new soul, Navlan, decided to demonstrate, hijacking the sorcerer's body whilst he slept, and committing massacres as a feat of strength. The sorcerer soon found out, and locked himself away along with the evil spirit within him, as to prevent any further malevolent acts. It's important to note that the spirit tied to the sorcerer was not developed during his experiments, but merely awakened. Long ago, the spirit Navlan was also a sorcerer, one who used hexes to create dark spells, such as the Scraps of Life. His goal was to restore the banned art of resurrection, possibly to overcome the grief of losing a loved one, or perhaps the idea itself simply interested him. His endeavours came at a considerable cost, as due to the use of hexing, which was banned from most kingdoms, the heretic Navlan was executed along with his entire village, and the mere utterance of his name became a crime. Navlan is often described as an exiled sorcerer, suggesting that he had been forewarned of the consequences of hexing, and yet his courage did not waver as he continued to practice his craft until it led him to the grave. It appears that foregoing his death, Navlan succeeded in his goal, casting a spell that would allow his consciousness to live on whilst his body decayed, until awakened by the royal sorcerer at a later point. If the bearer of the curse is to entertain the evil spirit, Navlan will request four acts of murder to be committed, placing targets on the heads of Gilligan, Kale, Falcon, and the Emerald Herald. It is unclear why Navlan would care to target Gilligan and Kale, possibly to test the moral standings of the bearer of the curse. But the choice of Falcon, the outcast, raises some questions. Falcon is also a sorcerer, one that is devoted to utilizing the power of the dark and hexes and the staff he carries was forged by Lord Aldia. It is possible that the Royal Sorcerer, Falcon and Aldia were all members of the Drang Lake Royal Court, and collaborated in conducting numerous experiments to uncover the secrets of immortality. If so, then attacking those who are of value to the Royal Sorcerer 
is Navlan's method of retaliating against the one who imprisoned him. This stands true for targeting the Emerald Herald, as she was likely the creation of Aldia and the Royal Sorcerer, one of their many failed solutions to break the undead curse. Navlan is painted as the evil part of a fractured vessel, whilst the Royal Sorcerer is the model for good. The two form a complete being, harbouring both good and evil, each of which fight for ascendancy. The more accurate depiction of Navlan is tragic, however. The once passionate sorcerer banished from all magic academies and exiled to his village, and then executed along with his entire community, likely killing any family he had with him. The soul of Navlan is not one of evil, but a spirit of vengeance. Beyond the Guardian Dragon, a lift awaits the bearer of the curse, elevating them to the highest peak above the surface. The Dragon Airy, a land housing countless dragons, connected by nothing but worn out rope bridges. If one is to miraculously make it through these fatal lands, they'll find themselves arriving at the Dragon Shrine, a temple built in service of the ancient dragon. The shrine is teeming with dragon knights, equipped with armour crafted from the scales of a black dragon. The Black Dragon Great Shield tells the story of a dragon that lost its tail to a brave warrior in a magnificent battle, and the tail was later used to forge several legendary weapons. Is it possible that we now bear witness to the equipment crafted from the remains of Kalamit, the black dragon slain by the chosen undead long ago? Reaching the top of the shrine, the bearer of the curse is acquainted with the ancient dragon, who gives them an ashen mist heart, a thing of magic allowing one to delve into the memories of the withered. The murk shifts and stirs, yet another stands before us. Then so be it, for the curse of life is the curse of want, and so you peer into the fog in hopes of answers. The ancient dragon is often referred to as a false deity, a prop. Sweet Chalkwa even references this entity as a being that's playing the part of a dragon insinuating that it's a creature of dubious origins. The dragon soul is said to have been created by those who appeared into the essence of the soul. The Emerald Herald describes Vendrick in this exact way, implying that the king, alongside Aldia, gave life to this ancient being. Whilst the Guardian variant was a small-scale success, the ancient dragon demonstrates Aldia's considerable progress in attaining immortality, albeit through the recreation of an everlasting dragon. With the Ashen Mist heart in hand, the bearer of the curse can pierce through space and time, unraveling the mysteries of the war against the giants. If the curse bearer is to trace back their steps and revisit the cave which housed the Duke's dear Freya, they can use the Ashen Mist Heart to interact with the crystal below the Pale Dragon, revealing a path into the dragon memories, reversing the hands of time to a crucial point in history. This places the bearer of the curse in a land shrouded by fog, grey crags, and fallen everlasting dragons, with the notion that the Pale Dragon is Seath the Scaleless. It is possible that the memory belongs to him, dating back to when Seath betrayed his own kind, a show of his treason, evidenced by the deceased dragon, laying motionless, rotting away with time. Transitioning to a war of a different era, inside the memory of Vamar, an injured captain warns of a losing battle, pleading that one must turn back and leave at once, as this is not a fight to be involved in. Following the king's siege on the land of the giants, the giants sought to invade Drang Lake, in retaliation to humanity's wrongdoings. As they descended upon Drang Lake, Captain Drummond was charged with manning the Cordial Tower and ensuring that the giants do not reach the king's residence. Drummond speaks of a leader amongst the towering beasts, one that is certain to be their king. No matter how formidable the being may be, Captain Drummond did not fear death, swearing to stand tall until his last moments and fall with his honor intact and sword clasped in hand. My blade may break my arrows fall wide, but my will shall never be broken.
Those who live by the sword will die by it. And I, Drummond, won't go down without drawing mine. As valiant as he was, Drummond failed his mission to uphold the fort. But even with the stronghold overrun by the giants, a slither of hope remained as the bearer of the curse boldly enters the battle with a firm assurance that the tides of the war are soon to be shifted. This unknown hero marched through memories of the past, slaughtering the giants one by one, from the memories of Vamar to Oro, and finally the memory of Jay, battling to rescue the fate of Drang Lake from its imminent demise, with the ultimate threat being the giant lord. The curse bearer charges through a bridge covered with the corpses of both fallen soldiers and giants, evading multiple projectiles, until finally reaching the leader of the invaders, a showdown that would define the future of a kingdom. Cut down from the base, the giant lord collapsed to the ground, every inch of his size turned against the titan, sending shockwaves through the ground upon impact. Commonly, upon death, giants become one with nature, turning into great trees, but the giant lord's fate would differ from the norm. What remained of him following the battle was dragged into a cave beneath the fort, where he would be chained and sealed away for eternity. Many years later, the giant lord would come to be known as the last giant. He who'd once again be faced with the unknown warrior that struck him down. Still resentful of his defeat, the last giant recognizes the bearer of the curse and seizes the opportunity to exact revenge. Though with his strength now greatly diminished, the last giant would be laid to rest one last time. History is often written by the victors, and so the truth in its purest form remains clouded in mystery, but with the possession of the Ashen Mist Heart, the bearer of the curse was able to explore a timeline of the past, and not only experience the giant's invasion on Drang Lake, but actively take part in the war rewriting history with every swing of their blade. With this newly found phenomenon, all that is concealed will be exposed, and the world's lies will bear their true essence. Testament to Lord Aldia's profound adage, no matter how tender, how exquisite, a lie will remain a lie. Propelled by tales of ancient crowns buried deep in the conflicts of Drang Lake, the bearer of the curse journeys to unfamiliar grounds, unfolding remarkable history embedded in a land long forgotten, hidden far below the surface of the world, a lost kingdom swallowed by the wrath of an everlasting dragon, a supposed deity idolized by a naive king and his adherents, a mark of misplaced faith, humanity worshiping what remains of a race nearing its extinction desperately seeking answers to make sense of their burdensome existence in a world of tragedy and death. Long ago, Sin the Slumbering Dragon was discovered in the lowermost depths of the world. The dragon slept in peace, although burdened with a buildup of poison that had long brewed within his very core. Surrounding his resting place, the city of Shulva was constructed. The very foundations of this kingdom was crafted in awe of the deity that humanity had unearthed the Kingdom of Shulva was governed by an unnamed king of the past, now recognized as the Sunken King, alongside Ilana, the Squalid Queen. As the city flourished, the number of worshippers multiplied. The growth of the kingdom ensured that a concrete system was in place to preserve the dragon's deep slumber, entrusting Sanctum soldiers and knights to defend Shulva from any invader who dares to set foot where unwelcomed. Sanctum priestesses, followers of Ilana, were charged with singing melodies that would keep the dragon at rest. However, one must wonder if a phrase or even an echo of their songs ever truly impacted the dragon. The soothing vocals may have been not more than a sacred tradition, preserved through time as a sign of love and respect for their deity. Or perhaps there are more sinister forces at play here, ones destined to bring ruin to the city of Shulva, after all, the pillars of this civilization were formed on a basis of faith placed in an everlasting dragon, a creature capable of toppling an empire if evoked. What could possibly go wrong? Inevitably, 
As with all kingdoms of the past, a threat reveals itself and challenges the rule of the current monarchy. However, in this case, the goal is not sovereignty, but the acquisition of the blood of the dragon. Shulvo was attacked by Sir Yorg and his army of Drake Blood Knights, who sought the dragon's blood to gain a better understanding of life, to transcend their own banal existence. Perhaps they also believed Sin to be a deity of sorts. What is known for certain is that they worshipped the blood of the dragons and were led by Sir Yorg in a siege of the Eternal Sanctum. Their path to further knowledge couldn't differ any more than that of the Sunken King. The Drake Blood Knights proved too powerful for the Guardians of the City, severing their bodies with each purposeful swing of their mighty greatswords, which encapsulated the essence of what they fought for with an insignia chiseled upon its hilt, symbolizing dragon's blood. The Sanctum Knights fought with every ounce of their being, as they renounced their own flesh to eternally guard the Sanctum from Sir Yorg and his Drake Blood Knights. Although honorable, this was to no avail, as all who stood in between Sir Yorg and Sin were slaughtered. Bodies piled up throughout the city. The king witnessed the blood of his people decorate the walls of the kingdom he had built and made his final stand against the invaders, fighting with all he had believed in as he took his final breath, protecting the dragon's sanctum. The last image he witnessed was the red cloth wrapped around the drake blood armor, waving triumphantly as they passed his debilitated body, the red cloth symbolizing the sacred blood of dragons. What follows the fall of the king is best illustrated by Sayorg's ring, which reveals that when Sayorg faced Sin, the slumbering dragon, he drew blood with a flash of his steel, but Sin responded by spewing forth the poison that had long brewed within him, blanketing the city in a miasmic cloud. Sir Yorg disturbed the dragon with a single great strike of his spear, unaware that evoking the beast would awaken its wrath, unleashing a lifetime of encapsulated rage. Sin rained death upon the city, releasing the poison that it had harbored for many ages, toppling the kingdom to its bare foundations and putting an end to Sir Yorg and his siege. The eternal sanctum, the once towering bulwark, crumbled with the city shortly after Sin's awakening, clearing the long-standing history of the kingdom with a single smite. Spewing the poisonous fog resulted in Sin restoring his purity at the cost of a kingdom, its king, alongside Sir Yorg and his legion. A tragic end to a race that discovered a dragon, worshipped its magnificence and perished by its side. Queen Ilana, having survived the collapse of Shulva, resides in the dragon's rest and continues to sing her lullabies whilst facing a mural depicting the dragon overlooking his worshippers who pray beneath him. Suspiciously, she's the only one to have survived the city's destruction. How could this have been? Upon further investigation, it is revealed that Ilana was born as a fragment of Manus, father of the Abyss, making her sister to Nishandra. As a child of the Abyss, she represents a shard of Manus's emotions Ilana constitutes the trait of wrath and anger, as evidenced by the vengeful path she pursues following the loss of her city. This child of dark accompanies the dragon, slowly amassing souls in anticipation of the coming day of vengeance. Now a collector of souls, Ilana continues to grow in power as she prepares for vengeance to strike again, punishment for the sins of challenging Mother Nature, the forceful continuation of the Age of Fire. The coming day of vengeance refers to the arrival of judgment in the form of a vessel that will lead the world to an age of dark and vanquish all who had sided with the light. Until then, the daughters of Manus desperately seek a worthy vessel for such a cause. One thing that remains to be revealed is that of how Sin had come to harbor poison within him, as all through history, there are no signs of everlasting dragons innately possessing a buildup of poison. Further affirming this notion is the soul of Sin, which specifies that following the reign of poison that was released, the dragon had restored its purity, insinuating that it had been pure once upon a time before being burdened with the toxin. One theory links back to the inception of the Age of Fire, suggesting that when the Four Lords stood to face the everlasting dragons, 
sin was present in the war, and Nito's miasma of death and disease binded the dragon to a lifetime of poison, causing Sin to retreat deep beneath the surface, where it would hibernate until awakened by Sir Yorg. A subsequent theory attempts to justify why the Kingdom of Shulva worshipped Sin, speculating that prior to becoming a flourishing civilization, Shulva was infested with poison. Sin may have sacrificed his well-being to consume the poison, suppressing its effects and keeping the harmful substance at bay, resulting in the king and those who followed to worship Sin for the sacrifice he made for their sake. This mirrors the sacrifice carried out by the fair lady, offering up her health to save her servants from a parasitic disease, which in result led to them worshipping her. This theory makes Sin's rampage sympathetic, as from its perspective, the dragon sacrificed a great deal for the people of Shulva, only for them to pay its kindness with betrayal. Poetic in a way, weaponizing the very poison the dragon had suppressed, to spew it back in the face of those it had protected, and vanquish the kingdom in its entirety. The most likely possibility places Alana as the culprit, suggesting that she, along with her priestesses, had sung spells of poison into sin, under the guise of keeping the dragon at rest. Ilana may have put together this evil concoction to further a grand plan to spread darkness, a way of extinguishing those who seek the light. She's referred to as the Squalid Queen, which is associated with being extremely dirty and unpleasant, especially as a result of poverty or neglect. Not exactly how you'd expect a queen to be described. As a fragment of Manus, Ilana likely came from nothing fought her way into becoming a queen, and manipulated the King of Shulva until she grew powerful enough to destroy the kingdom from within. Similar to how her sister Nashandra is responsible for the fall of Drang Lake, Ilana may have caused the fall of Shulva. Although there's no clear evidence of this being the case, history has proven to repeat itself many times over. If the pattern of repeating cycles are to hold any credibility in this world, it is plausible that Alana and Nishandra had set out with identical goals of crippling kingdoms that advocate the Age of Light in order to bring forth the Dark. A continuation of their father's legacy, evidence of their success is visible in what remains of the Kingdom of Shulva and Drang Lake. As Alana awaits the Day of Vengeance, she is confronted with the bearer of the curse, who duels the Squalid Queen and puts an end to her ceaseless journey of spreading the dark. To gain the crown of the Sunken King, one must face the destroyer of cities, the essence of calamity itself, Sin, the slumbering dragon. Grasping a narrow victory, the curse bearer achieves what Sir Yorg and his legion could not, executing the towering dragon that had possessed the kingdom of Shulva interminably. The deliverer of crowns now wields the crown of the Sunken King, Seeker of fire, I see you've subdued another foul creature. One of the father of the abyss spawn. That confounded quintessence of humanity. The abyss once had form, but then dissipated. And yet, traces of its existence endured. Each fragment, thirsting for power, spread dark with no relent. In search of a second lost crown of a past king, the bearer of the curse finds themselves gazing upon several high-reaching towers, isolated from all civilization, and connected only by metal chains spanning miles across the skies. The towers are seen resting above a volcanic wasteland and sprawling high above the clouds. To understand the origin of these peculiar towers, one must go back to a time long ago, to the beginning of a kingship derived from the lust for power and glory. The tale of the old Iron King begins with a little known, unestablished lord who possessed dreams of grandeur. From the ruins of the old kingdom of Ven, the enfeebled lord began crafting his empire with what little resources he could muster. 
But with the discovery of an iron-producing miracle, the tides of power began to shift within Drang Lake. The scorching iron scepter was capable of harnessing the powers of iron and enabled the Lord to produce an endless supply of the material. The construction of the Broom Tower birthed many creations that would later flourish into a kingdom. The tower was a base of operations, hosting a giant clockwork contraption that worked in accordance with the Iron Scepter, which transferred heat to the tower, resulting in iron being manufactured on a grand scale. One can only envision the extent of what could be forged with this interminable resource. Infinite possibilities laid in the palm of the Lord, and he was not short of inventive ideas. Capitalizing on his newly discovered marvel, the Lord assembled his own army of iron soldiers. With the help of a dear companion, the Magus Eagil, the soldiers were granted life by a rare enchantment, an infusion of iron and souls. Every king resides in a castle, a display of their strength to the world, and so the Lord paraded his power by erecting a castle of his own, crafted from pure iron, infamously known as the Iron Keep. Reborn as a powerful leader, the Iron King decorated his formidable fortress with a vast collection of weapons, moving contraptions, and iron sculptures, to name a few of the many pillars designed to showcase his accomplishments. He even tried his hand at forging a dragon out of iron. In the heyday of his land, the old Iron King fancied entertaining dubious and eccentric guests from faraway lands. Most of them were charlatans, but among the riffraff was an unusual knight from the Far East. He trained the Iron King's men in the sword, in obeisance to his new lord. The unusual knight being Sir Alon, a masterful swordsman who aided the Iron King in elevating his kingdom's stance in Drang Lake. The extent of Sir Alon's involvement in establishing the King's empire remains clouded, and some sources suggest that Sir Alon chose to serve the king in the early days of his reign, whilst others claim that the kingdom was in its prime when Sir Alon offered his expertise to the king. Over time, Sir Alon became the king's most trusted knight, but at the very peak of his sire's rule, Sir Alon set out again in search of lands yet unknown. The sudden departure never explained, and his absence sorely missed. The old Iron King bequeathed Sir Alon's name to his Iron Warriors, a sign of respect and gratitude towards the mysterious knight that helped shape a kingdom, a meaningful gesture emanating from a far from gracious king. As the kingdom continued to blossom, the Magus Eagil, under the king's commands, sought to grant fire a will of its own, creating pyromancies such as the Dance of Fire and Fire Snake. Alas, no amount of growth could satiate the greed of an arrogant king, as regardless of what he gained, his gluttonous hunger overthrew his fulfillment. In pursuit of an unbreakable empire, the Old Iron King, alongside Egil, furthered their experiments of giving life to fire, but little did they know, they were meddling with forces far beyond their competence. Egil's precipitous enchantment to awaken fire backfired to the highest of degrees. The earth spouted fire, and a beast arose from the flames. The short-sighted king was incinerated by the creature in one swing, and his castle devoured in a sea of flames. In a flash, the king as we knew him ceased to exist, his life taken by a mass of iron that had been given a soul. Was this metal Goliath there from the beginning, or was it a product of the king's conceit? Succumbing to the flames that swallowed his castle, the Iron King's flesh was charred, and his soul possessed by the things that lurk below. His legion of Alon knights, although mightier than Alan's iron, were submerged by the flames that devoured the King's land, a consequence of unbridled greed. Swallowed by the scorching iron, the old Iron King came in contact with the one whose name must not be repeated, and became a vessel that bred Icarus Earth. Who could this possibly be referring to? The Old King's soul, which can be retrieved upon the Old Iron King's death, reads, The once magnificent soul continues to exert influence over the land, even after the eons have reduced it to these remnants. An influential soul from an era long past, could it be 
The old Iron King, through all the years past, continued to live on through Gwyn's soul. The human ego. How many ugly iron castles has it erected? And they don't even see the folly of their ways. But that's what makes watching humankind so delightful. <laughs> it reminds me of someone who lived long ago. A vainglorious liar who ended up hurling himself into the flames. Now he's Icarus Earth, if I'm not mistaken. In wake of the tragic events that transpired, Egil, having been responsible for the collapse of a kingdom and the downfall of its ruler, eternally punishes herself for the sins she's committed. She confines herself to a dark, empty room as a prisoner of Sinner's Rise. The legend of the Old Iron King and Amagus Egil mirror that of Gwyn and the Witch of Isolith, a powerful being commanding his associate who skilled in the art of pyromancy to give life to fire, only to birth a colossal flame that devours a kingdom and births demons. The Old Witch Soul description matches that of the Old King Soul, further linking them to a cycle etched in history, a doomed fate they knew not of. Were their actions that of evil, or were they victims of their own destiny, a written providence guiding them down a path to repeating the mistakes of the Lord's past. Even so, life knows not of compassion, and so Egil devotes the remainder of her life, repenting for her sins, known not for her good deeds, or even her mistakes, but as a nobody, a lost sinner. Following the kingdom's collapse, a child of dark, bearing inconceivable strength, arrived from lands far away, seeking a king, but found herself in a kingless land, devoid of souls, and in journeying there, has all but condemned herself to a fate most wretched. Nadalia, a child of the Abyss Spawn, represents a fragment of Manus that equates to solitude and loneliness. In search of a king, Nadalia entered the Broom Tower and wandered the halls in the hope that she would cross paths with the king, but her hopes slowly diminished as all she could hear were the echoes of her footsteps bouncing off the desolate walls of a worn down tower. As she descended to the basement of the tower, Nadalia discovered the crown of the Old Iron King, confirming his demise. Finding herself secluded in a kingdom that had perished, Nadalia became dispirited and as a consequence, renounced her flesh and wandered broom tower. In the act of dancing, the Bride of Ash was transfigured as smoke, enticing people to her residence, and so her seat of power came to be known as the Broom Tower. Nadalia burned herself up in flames, whilst clasping the crown, and the smoke emitting from her body invited scores of men, who were dispatched to this land to tap the replete stores of iron. But they soon lost their nerve when faced with the Child of Dark and all but the most steadfast of them became servants of the Black Fog. To defend against intruders, the Bride of Ash entrusted her soul to the Ashen Idols scattered throughout the tower, and through them she was able to attack poachers, who attempted to retrieve the iron that had been abandoned. Excluding Nadalia, the Broom Tower ceased to receive many new arrivals, until one knight was courageous enough to make his entrance. The Rebel Raim, after his defeat by Valstadt, came to Broom Tower in search of greater strength. When he found it, it came not from a regal father like before, but from a newfound mother who gave him true purpose. Rain became infatuated with the Bride of Ash, and with his newly found motive, settled in the land of smoke and fog, guarding the dungeon of the tower, and with it, the remnants of the queen's body, now molded from ashes. Shifting away from his old ways of life, Rain became a stalwart warrior, and although he had the ability to expunge the Black Fog, he chose to embrace it and accompany the Child of Dark that haunts his sword. As time passed, the bearer of the curse discovered the Broom Tower, and its history began to unveil itself, and most intriguing was the finding of Sir Alon's armour, graciously displayed on a model figure. The placement of the armour may have been in admiration of the knight who imparted his expertise to the king, 
But upon interacting with the armour, the bearer of the curse travels into a past memory of the old Iron King, blurring the lines between what truly took place following Serolon's departure and what had been altered in the timeline as a result of a memory of the past being infiltrated. Having entered the memory, the curse bearer is halted by a myriad of Alon knights, standing in guard of their master and his fortress. Conquering the opposition leads to a vast silver chamber with spotless marble flooring and a blood-red sunset piercing through the wide open windows where Sir Alon awaits your arrival. With a clash of steel, the battle began. Both warriors fought valiantly, swiftly manoeuvring across the arena with grace. Their swords danced vigorously and nothing was held back. When the dust settled, the curse bearer stood tall as the victor, having bested a master at his own craft. In retrospect, whose triumph was this? Was it the bearer of the curse who fought the mighty Sir Alon? Or were they simply a vessel living through the memory of the Old Iron King, who at the height of his power pursued his old friend with vengeance at the heart of his motive? After all, no one turns their back on the Old Iron King, or at least that's how a power drunken king would justify their actions. In an unfortunate turn of events, Sir Alon is defeated by the king, the once student surpassing the master. Reaching the dungeon of the tower, the bearer of the curse discovers Knight Rame, now known as the Fume Knight, a result of absorbing Nadalia's black fog. His protective nature is displayed in full, as he instantly becomes hostile in protection of his queen. Wielding his Fume Sword and Ultra Great Sword, the knight guards the entrance to the Bride of Ash. Driven to acquire the crown of the Old Iron King, the curse bearer charges ahead, unshaken by the Fume Knight's presence. As the fight progresses, Raim calls upon the aid of his queen, infusing his sword with fire and dark. But even so, he falls short. The taste of defeat stings worse than ever, invoking the long-suppressed feelings of his loss at the hands of Valstadt, further demonstrating his disdain towards his former comrade. Raim will instantly ignite his sword if the curse bearer arrives wearing the armour of the Royal Aegis. The path now cleared, the bearer of the curse descends a staircase leading to the Bride of Ash and claims their prize, the crown of the Old Iron King. This land is barren, cursed by the old chaos. It gave birth to atrocities, and the people fled in fear. Until our lord, the Ivory King, came. To fulfill their purpose, the Seeker of Crowns ventures into a large, snow-covered kingdom, a barren wasteland with its residents frozen to death, and those who remain bear little of their humanity left. The tragedy that befell this kingdom is one of nature's doing, a consequence of the chaos flame ignited by the Witch of Isolith over a millennia ago. In attempting to recreate the first flame, a flame of chaos emerged and devoured the city of Isolith. The flame consumed the witch and moulded her into the bed of chaos. And although the twisted being was later defeated by the chosen undead, the chaos flame did not dissipate. Sooner or later, the flame reappeared deep below Ilium Lois, forcing the Ivory King to form a rampart structure to contain the ancient chaos. Going as far as placing his throne upon the very mouth of the flame. As a first line of defense, the king built a great cathedral to appease the raging flame. But when he sensed the degradation of his soul, he left without a word, leaving everything to Alsana, who had unbeknownst found a place at his side. But these were events of long ago, and today, no one even remembers the king's name. My dear lord, a most true king. 
It was with, with his magnificent soul that he built a lay of noise and contained the spread of chaos. But the chaos would not be sated, and the king gave his own soul. Inevitably, the king was drained of vigor and plunged into the chaos's heart. Who was this king who put his people before himself, relinquishing his own kingdom to subdue the Chaos Flame? The Ivory King hails from the land of Ferosa, famously known for its god of war, Farum. Sad to say, the territory of Ferosa became lawless after the kingdom fell to war. Nonetheless, after being crowned, the Ivory King was the first to offer his hand in times of need, be it for his homeland of Ferosa or his people. The king was known to be ever so merciful and devoted to his great land, willing to do whatever necessary to protect his people. His kindness was not to be fooled for weakness, as when necessary, the king was firm in disciplining those who have wronged him. He was known for exiling people into the frigid outskirts, where the relentless blizzard does not tire, a fate worse than death. Those who were exiled either died from the harsh environment or were granted a merciful death by the king's pets, Lud and Zalin. Entrusting the kingdom to Alsana, the Ivory King faced the flame head on, plunging down to the depths of chaos. His knights patiently awaited his return, but a great deal of time passed, and their king was still nowhere in sight. The wait became too long to bear. Sir Fabian led the loyal knights of Ilium Lois to follow their king into chaos. The honourable soldiers fought valiantly to exterminate the creatures that dwelled below, but unfortunately, as with the Ivory King, the majority of the selfless knights were never seen again. Burdened with the responsibility of leading Ilium Lois, Alsana prays in silent vigilance. The Child of Dark, in reverence of the Apocalypse, devotes herself to a ritual in hopes of appeasing the raging flame. Alsana is another fragment of Manus, the Augur of Fear. Similar to her sisters, she journeyed forth in search of a king. Alsana sought the Ivory King in the hopes that his strength would drown out her fears. But upon arriving in Ilium Lois, what she found was of much greater value. Alsana was welcomed with open arms and the king's genuine affection and compassion provided comfort beyond imagination. Soon after, she found a place by the king's side devoting herself to him as his oracle. Before delving into the flame, the Ivory King tasked Arva, one of his seven pets, in guarding the beloved Child of Dark and gifted Alsana a special sword inscribed with the name of the land, a final farewell. I am, in fact, the incarnation of my father's fears. I saw that the king of this land was strong. I sought him only to sustain myself, to smother my fears. Now, I realize that he may have known all along. I was born of fear, and my lord provided comfort. And so, here I remain, heiress to my lord's wishes, watching over chaos. Until the end of time. In 
In safeguarding Ilium Lois from the encroaching chaos, a great wall of ice was built surrounding the kingdom, suppressing the scorching hot flame deep underground. This came at a hefty cost, as when the ivory gates opened, the cold found its way in, rendering the land uninhabitable. Those who were fortunate escaped, others can still be seen buried beneath the snow. The lifeless city was watched over by priestesses, who similar to Alsana, had devoted themselves to appeasing the flame. Retainers were tasked with attending the priestesses, but with them gone, the retainers were void of purpose and wandered the frigid lands of Ilium Lois thereafter. The few knights of Lois who survived delving into the flame, although frozen over, remained faithful to the king's orders, awaiting the call of their master. With the Ivory King submerged in the chaos, who is to lead the advance on the swollen flame? Here arrives the bearer of the curse, unknowingly placing themselves in the heart of the conflict. At the request of the Oracle, who pleads for her lord's rescue from the unspeakable chaos, the bearer of the curse takes it upon themselves to recruit the Knights of Lois to fight by their side. Freed from the shackles of frozen time, they pledge their sword to their saviour and march forth towards the inferno. In lead of their garrison, the curse bearer, without hesitation, plunges into the unknown, a leap of faith. The zealous Knights of Lois, in a heartbeat, follow their masters every step, vowing to strike down each malformed terror that arose from chaos, and they would not hesitate even if it were their own king. From the old chaos emerge charred Knights of Lois, burned black by the flame, the same chivalrous knights who fought and fell alongside their once proud king now reside in the realm of fire. Having lost all sense of self, they roam aimlessly, in constant agony as they continue to burn by the eternal flame. Their rage lives on, driven only by the urge to eradicate those who disturb the flame, no matter who they may be, even their former comrades. As the battle unfolded, the bearer of the curse and their four knights of Lois fought with true purpose, guiding the many woeful souls that lurked below to a place of peace. Admirable sacrifices were made to subdue the flame, as one by one, the knights began surrendering their bodies to the portals of chaos, freezing the pathways between realms. In the midst of the mayhem, one more portal appears, one larger than any previously encountered, from a cloud of fire and darkness emerges the burnt Ivory King. Stripped of his sanity, the King wreaks havoc on his own loyal knights. Those who've come to rescue their noble King would meet their end by his charred blade. With the bearer of the curse still standing, it is up to them to put an end to the burnt Ivory King, rescuing him from the depth of hell and putting his tormented soul at ease. A bittersweet victory at the cost of an honorable King the sacrifice of the Ivory King is to be spoken of for eternity, an example of true leadership, a virtuous take on what it means to burden oneself with a crown, a true king if there ever was one. As for the curse bearer, who seeks no glory or accolades, claims the crown of the Ivory King, concluding their journey through befallen kingdoms. With the flame submerged, Ilium Lois successfully snuffed the old chaos, and as a result, the demon race began to dwindle in numbers, slowly dying out without the replenishing of the chaos flame, gradually being guided to near extinction. Innumerable demon corpses are discovered many years later, piled up within the smouldering lake, a result of the Ivory King immolating himself to the chaos, enabling Ilium Lois to employ ice magic and freeze the eternal flame. Following the battle, the bearer of the curse bids farewell to Alzana, who without the comfort of her lord, the child of dark, may revert back to her state of incessant fear. If anything is to be noted from her journey, it is that fate can be disrupted. Unlike her sisters, who played into their predestined fate of spreading dark and banishing the light, Alsana subverted the expectations that had latched onto her from birth and simply sought a life of comfort and compassion. Could it be that even a child of dark can seek solace? I am not the only one.
even dark seek solace, and more so, souls. Magnificent souls, like your own. One day, you may encounter another, another being born of dark. Having united the three crowns, the bearer of the curse travels into the memory of the king, a point in time during King Vendrick's self-imposed exile. In bestowing the crowns to the king, the offering is reciprocated in the form of Vendrick's blessing, an enchantment infused into the crowns, enabling the beholder to resist becoming cursed, and better yet, resist becoming a hollow. What are the implications of a gift of this magnitude? It is made apparent that foregoing Vendrick's tragic end, he sought the crowns of the fallen kings in hopes of resolving the blasphemous hex that is the undead curse. In light of the crowns being acquired by the curse bearer, King Vendrick, even in death, is granted a second chance in fulfilling his goal. But does Vendrick's blessing truly break the curse, or is it more in line for being a temporary solution? keeping the curse at bay whilst other avenues are explored. Anyhow, having become a vessel to complete Vendrick's imperfect journey, the bearer of the curse takes their leave and heads towards their end goal, the throne of want. As mentioned previously, when King Vendrick and his brother Aldia used the four great souls to form the kingdom of Drang Lake, a secret room was created housing the Throne of Want, akin to the Kiln of the First Flame, a means of sustaining the Age of Fire. Whilst Vendrick was hesitant to claim the throne, Nashandra had an assured desire to bring forth the Age of Dark, the Throne of Want being the sole motivator for her arrival in Drang Lake. Remaining faithful to the King's request, the Throne Watcher and Defender stand as guardians of the Sacred Throne, shielding the world from Nishandra's evil. Unaware of the king's approval, the guardians do not grant access to the throne of want, forcing the bearer of the curse to dispose of them, even if reluctantly. In doing so, the one obstacle obstructing Nishandra's path to the throne is removed, inciting the Queen of Drang Lake to reveal herself, not as the facade of beauty she is known to convey, but in her truest form, the authentic depiction of darkness. Nashandra, ever so close to fulfilling her destiny, stands ready to usurp the bearer of the curse's quest and claim the throne for herself. In stating, you have proven yourself to me, Nashandra confesses that since the very first encounter with the curse bearer, she has been exploiting their ignorance, directing them to amass the king's great soul, elevating their being to match that of Vendrick's. Finally, a soul powerful enough to satiate Nishandra's lust for strength. Anything less would be inadequate for this prisoner of desire. The Queen's own strategy became her undoing, as the seeker of adversity, through all the turmoil they had faced and kings conquered, grew in power far beyond what she had envisioned. Ironic that a fragment of the dark manipulated humanity into aiding her claim to the throne only to underestimate their strength once she no longer needed them. Mindful of this knowledge, it is no revelation that the bearer of the curse defeats Nashandra with little effort. In an instant, the fragments of the abyss who nourished their beings by the side of would-be monarchs ceased to exist. Their destiny stripped away, their fates contorted. Why does this triumph taste of bitterness? Was eradicating the children of the abyss in service to the world, or was it favourable to those who seek the prolonging of the flame's cycle? When the father of the abyss perished from existence, the dark shattered into tiny pieces, leaving behind the shards of Manus, who came to be Nashandra, Queen of Drang Lake, Elana, the squalid queen, Nadalia, the bride of Ash, and finally, Alsana, the silent oracle, 
These beings were destined to seek power. Their very existence formed to facilitate the spreading of the dark and extinguishing the light. They are often described as foul creatures, but is their existence truly of menace to the world? One day, the flames will fade, ushering in the age of man and restoring nature's organic flow of time. When the Lord of Light banished dark, the flux of life was shattered and the repercussions trickled down to humanity. Initially, they were cast away to be secluded from civilization, followed by being branded with the dark sign, binding humanity to the undead curse in perpetuum, a fate unjust for a race seized of their inherent claim to the world. When the Age of Ancients reached the end of its cycle, the Age of Fire was welcomed. When it came time for further evolution, the Age of Dark was denied its stay. History's cyclical nature remains unchanged, as once again, the Children of Dark, who've arrived to guide the world back on its course, are renounced of their rightful declaration to a new age. As the divide between people continues to create a rift in the world's structure, order is quietly submerged in chaos, and the distinction between light and dark becomes distorted. Generations pass in an instant, kingdoms rise to the highest of calibers, and in time, collapse all the same. It is for this reason that Vendrick never claimed the throne for himself. Of course, one mustn't rule out the possibility that Vendrick simply lacked the courage to face the fate of the world, as his very soul suggests that when he was beckoned by the dark, Vendrick was overwhelmed. This king, who once ruled the world of men, was a lacking vessel for the true throne. This paints Vendrick as a feeble monarch, unable to act when called upon. But the truth is in the detail, as Vendrick's inaction may be the greatest protest to the fabric of cycles. In his early days, King Vendrick too sought fire, believing that with it, he could harness the undead curse. Oblivious to the fact that the inception of the curse derived from the very flame he pursued. In realizing his error, Vendrick had an epiphany, deeming the light and the dark to be one and the same, each incapable of existing without the other. With fire came disparity, heat and cold, life and death, light and dark. A shadow is not cast, but born of fire, and the brighter the flame, the deeper the shadow. In inheriting fire, one could harness the dark. Devoted to this idea, Vendrick chose to embrace the light and dark equally, but he lacked the wisdom to see this concept come to fruition. The king's fight for truth was cut short, and although unable to satisfy his hunger for answers, Vendrick died with the clarity of knowing that an answer lies beyond dividing light and dark, but in marrying the benefits of both. The king's brother Aldia was of a similar mind, trusting that success comes in the form of averting the cycle of ages and breaking the predestined chain of light and dark. However, his philosophy differed greatly from Vendrick's. They both sought the truth, but through different means. Aldia, the scholar of the first sin, studied the actions of Lord Gwyn tirelessly, attempting to uncover the secrets of life itself. He believed the undead to be the key to this mystery. If he could untie the facet of hollowing from the tether of the undead curse, then it would be no curse at all to live on past death without the prerequisite of becoming hollow, a blessing if anything. This single breakthrough would ascend humanity beyond its mortal coil, while liberating it from the plague it had long carried. Through his diabolical experiments, Aldi approved that the dark could be used to transcend life's physical boundaries, manifested in the creation of the Forlorn. In an attempt to escape the cycle, Aldia likely sought to transcend his physical being and command the first flame, becoming akin to a god, the controlling hand that unites the universe. If this theory proves true, Aldia would wield the means to manipulate the curse's spread through the dark sign and achieve the goal he had set out to conquer. When the bearer of the curse's path converges with Aldia's, the scholar acknowledges that he had ultimately failed. The consequences of his ambitious endeavor, written all over his being, now a deformed creature, 
a slave to the first flame. The one who challenged the karma, now shackled to the very thing he fought to control. Proof that the first flame answers to no human or deity. Aldia sacrificed all that held meaning to him for the sake of freeing humanity from the fate of the curse, casting a wrench into the twilight machine comprising reality. His morally inept experiments would have been justified if only he had succeeded, but his efforts amount to nothing. Having made peace with his shortcomings, Aldia looks to the bearer of the curse for answers and is met with silence. The lack of response speaks a thousand words for itself as the young Hollow intends to pave their own path, no longer looking to others for solutions. As a final test of strength, Aldia stands to face the young Hollow, a final hurdle for them to prove their worth. Following his defeat, Aldia imparts his wisdom onto the bearer of the curse and several choices present themselves. In proceeding to the throne of want, the bearer of the curse would accept their role in the cycle, linking the first flame as the Lord of Light once did, prolonging the Age of Fire. In rejecting their duty, they choose to play no part in further warping the natural state of the world, walking away from the deceptive pilgrimage created by the gods to sustain their powers on the back of human sacrifice. To not preserve the light or advocate for the dark is to pursue an alternative as King Vendrick and Aldia once did. Their results leave little hope for requirement as one hollowed in a crypt and another lived on as a deformed entity bound to the flame for now and ever. In retaliating against fate, fate has proven to win on every occasion. In such a case, why fight a losing battle when it's much less a burden to fall in line and fuel the perpetual cycle like many who've come before? Whilst aware of their faint chance of breaking the loop, the bearer of the curse, in a true show of character, ventures into the unfamiliar in search of a permanent solution to end the curse. In favouring one age over another, the world neglected the possibility of something else entirely. The juxtaposition of light versus dark draws a linear boundary to a vertical of infinite possibilities. In truth, regardless of the age that prevails, the victor will always be the cycle itself, observing as the world quarrels over what comes next, like marionettes controlled by the strings of time. The bearer of the curse ignites hope for freedom, a beacon of promise for humanity, who have lived in a plane of suffering since their inception. In acquiring Vendrick's blessing, a new course can be charted without the hindrance of the curse. Make no mistake, Vendrick's blessing was intended for humanity, and humanity alone, as only in human form could someone access the vault to his crown. Vendrick, through all his flaws, placed his faith in humanity. In light of their inherent limitations, he did not look to the gods for answers, but believed in men to seek adversity and bring peace to the world. Beyond the scope of light and reach of dark is the balance between order and chaos. The answer to the tragedy of human existence, if only one is brave enough to walk the path of the unknown, Sometimes I feel obsessed with this insignificant thing called self. Am I wrong to feel so? Maybe we're all cursed from the moment we're born. Humans were one with the dark. The former king of light, he feared humans. Feared that they would usher in an age of dark. Regret, anguish, bewilderment. What? Wonderful gifts they are. They are the essence of life. Don't you agree? They say that she is the last firekeeper. That she is a gentle shepherd, lighting the way for you cursed fools. Nonsense. Bearer of the curse, if you are to be the next monarch, then one day you will walk those grounds without really knowing why. Many monarchs have come and gone, 
Not one of them stood here. As you do. Fire came to be, and with it, disparity. Heat and cold, life and death, light and dark. Dark was seen as a curse. Shadow is not cast, but born of fire. And the brighter the flame, the deeper the shadow. Inherit fire and harness the dark. Such is the calling of a true leader. Here we are, at the end of another Dark Souls video. Thank you very much for watching, we really appreciate you guys supporting us and the comments you leave behind on our videos have really motivated us to keep going and making more Dark Souls content. We've spent the last three months working on this and we're very excited to finally get to present it to you guys, so we really hope you've enjoyed it and if so, please let us know what you think in the comments, whether it's positive or negative, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, not only through the comments and your likes and support, the sub count is insane. We've had the biggest growth ever. Like, we've done this channel for years at this point, and in this last year alone, from when we started with Assassin's Creed and came all the way to Bloodborne and Dark Souls, our sub count has just increased so much, and it's just given us that motivation that we needed to keep going, and it shows us that we're doing something right here, and we're gonna keep giving that to you. And we're not gonna stop here. There's going to be a Dark Souls 3 story explained and it's going to come sooner than you think so stay tuned for that I'm really looking forward to doing that one so if you love this one and you've loved what we've done this year then just stay tuned because there's way more of that coming. So I'm not sure if you guys know but we do this YouTube thing as a hobby on top of full-time jobs working 9 to 5 so that's why it's kind of taken us longer than you'd expect to bring out these videos. Uh, we would love to be more consistent with it and provide you guys with the Dark Souls 3 video uh, quicker than we have done between Dark Souls 1 and 2 but it is a bit difficult with our current situation so if you would like to support us further you can always uh, support us on Patreon of course only if you can uh, it is much appreciated and it will help us make this hobby of ours kind of a, a job which is obviously something we'd love to do full time uh, not only will it help us make content at a faster pace but I think the quality itself will also improve uh, so if that's a possibility for you guys, we would really appreciate it. So please take a look at our Patreon, it's the first link in the description. So once again, thank you so much for your support, and we really hope you have an amazing end of the year. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas to everyone. We'll see you guys next year.